rhythm is number one. And I can remember, I think Victor was probably the first person to say um, to me, stop worrying about the distance and think more about the rhythm. And at the time, my uh, subconscious said, are you kidding? I don't, I don't have time to think about the rhythm. I'm too busy looking for a distance. Um, I didn't say anything because I was a very good student, but I remember thinking, what? You know, distance is everything. But if it's obvious and you're going around and that's all you're thinking about, it's going to be for the world to see and the horse will probably get quick if you're asking it to, you know, leave long or making multitudinous adjustments adjustments where the rhythm covers that up if you're a little bit deep to one and a little bit long to the other as long as you don't violate the rhythm it's almost um, uh, imperceptible welcome to the practical horseman podcast featuring conversations with respected riders industry leaders and horse care experts the show is co-hosted by practical horseman editors and our goal is to inform educate and inspire I'm Sandra Olenek, and this week's episode is with hunter, jumper, trainer, clinician, and judge, Holly Hugo Vidal. Based out of Brownwood Farm and Arbor Hill Farm in Georgia, U.S. Equestrian Federation Big R Judge Holly Hugo Vidal maintains a busy schedule training her junior and adult riders, as well as giving clinics and judging. With her former husband, Victor Hugo Vidal, she ran the successful show barn Cedar Lodge Farm in Stamford, Connecticut. Another mentor whom she discusses during our conversation is the legendary jumper and hunter rider Rodney Jenkins, who provided her with lessons in reading horses and creating in them a desire to please. She's also the author of the book, Build Confidence Over Fences. During our conversation, Holly talks about why details such as cleanliness and being on time for a class are important and how they affect your performance what she likes to see while judging hunter and equitation rounds, and why riders worry too much about seeing distances. She also gives a great exercise to help people who do become anxious about seeing a distance. It's one of my favorite. But before we get into the conversation, I'd like to share a word from this episode's sponsor, Bymeda. Bymeda might just be the largest animal health company you have never heard of till now. Bimeda Animal Health's equine products have been trusted by veterinarians and horse owners since the 1960s, where the company's Irish roots began. Bimeda is one of the largest producers of dewormers for horses, like Equimax, Bimectin, Duramectin, and Exodus. World-renowned equine athletes rely on polyglycan, a patented formula designed to replace lost or damaged synovial fluid and Confidence EQ 1% pheromone gel that reduces and prevents equine stress, to name a few of their branded products. Bimeda encourages you to consult with your veterinarian before using any equine products for your horse. Also, please visit bimedaus.com to learn more about their full product offerings and where you can buy them. Now, let's jump right into the conversation where Holly starts by talking about how she became interested in horses. What initially got me interested was going to watch one of my little friends have a lesson. I think I was about 10 and I went to watch her riding lesson and uh, found it very interesting and went home and asked my mother if I could do the same thing. And I started with a typical once a week lesson. One lesson became two lessons and that's how it started. Great. You know, I know in the past we've talked about whom you've trained with and who who's influenced you and um we've talked a bit about you know the legendary rodney jenkins can you talk about how you uh, became involved um in working with him and and how that evolved well initially um 
we were going to go, to, Victor and I were taking customer's horses to Florida for the circuit. And um, I would always admired Rodney and uh, had met him. And I asked him if I could, he was going to be stabled in Aiken, South Carolina for um, some period of time prior to going down to Florida. And I asked him if I could bring the horses down and stable with him. And uh, when I asked him, he said, well, I, I don't give riding lessons, but I will uh, work with you and teach you how to ride each horse. So I thought, well, that sounds like a good arrangement and very much what I was looking for. So I went down to Aiken with about, I think about maybe eight or 10 horses. And uh, he helped me with them. And one thing led to another and he ended up showing horses for us. And uh, then I ended up um, working for him. I rode the horses on the fl I was his flat rider for quite a while. Neat. And what, what would you say, actually backing up a little bit, um, you were married to Victor Hugo Vidal. Can you talk about, you know, how you met him and, and yeah, and I guess what you learned from him? Well, I had known him pretty much ever since I can remember. Uh, I used to board a horse at the Sleepy Hollow Country Club in Scarborough, New York. And I think that's where I first saw him. And um, so I kind of knew him ever since I was a child. And one day he uh, came over to the barn. I was working for the summer for Arthur Hawkins, riding his, or his sales horses. And Victor came over and offered me a job as his assistant. And Arthur was about to move to California, so it all fell in place. So I went to Cedar Lodge about 1970 and became Victor's assistant, so to speak. And then we um, got married about a year later. Great. And, um, you know, Victor, you know, was a genius in so many ways, you know, in terms of, um, you know, what you learned from him. Does anything in particular come to mind? I think um, a couple of things Victor was particularly good at was helping riders that didn't ride, didn't have natural ability. He was very good at creating a very successful rider who was not the um, most athletic, most talented. He gave them the tools that enabled them to win. And uh, he was great at that. And also preparing horses for riders. I learned uh, that most of the time I was with Victor, gave lessons and rode the customer's horses. And I learned how to ride each one to make them better for the individual rider, which um, is a skill in itself. Um, and one more question about Rodney. What, you know, is there anything in particular or lessons that you learned from him in terms of training horses that have, have sort of stuck with you? Are we talking about Rodney or Victor? Uh, Rodney. Rodney, yeah. Victor was more of a um, position uh, expert and more equitation. Rodney um, always... Rodney had an amazing ability to get inside a horse's mind and know what they were thinking and feeling. And um, horses tried for him. I never, I've never seen that. I mean, there are great writers like John French and um, Ken Charrington, and uh, I could go on and on, where horses go well for them, obviously. But there was something about Rodney that he almost thought the horse was saying, what does this man want? me to do. I mean, it was just amazing what, what horses did for him. And uh, the horse always came first, no matter what. And, uh, and that stayed with me probably more than anything. I, I don't watch the time when I give a lesson and I have the luxury of uh, not having <clears throat> that many riders are not lined up and they're waiting for their next lesson. So I always end on a good note. If I give a lesson, that's 
20 minutes long and the horse has just been fantastic, I'll stop at that. Or, or if I have a problem, I'll go longer than the time allotted. But I never um, really look at the time when I'm teaching. And that's, I think that's a reflection of Rodney. He'll leave a horse show early, a little local show. We've taken some green horses and they're all going really, really well. He'll just leave in the middle of the day where um, Victor was more stay to the end and try to be champion. So completely different approach. Yeah, very interesting. Um, you know, I wanted to move into judging because you're a, a, obviously a, a well-known judge. Um, how did you, how did that happen? Like when, when did you start judging and why did you decide you wanted to be a judge? Well, when I married Victor, he was judging all the time and I would go with him to shows. I didn't, I never judged. I'd go along and, um, I started needle pointing to fill in the, the time and it was fun watching good riders, but I didn't feel like I was really accomplishing that much. So I started judging um, because of, of Victor's schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what, what do you like about judging? I think the best part about judging for me is getting out and seeing um, riders and horses in different areas. And uh, it also carries over into my teaching because well, I remember when I first started to judge, I would look at um, teaching completely differently. I, I look at it from a judge's point of view. So I was able to help people more uh, when I started judging. Hmm. Interesting. Um, is there anything you don't like about judging? I don't like um, waiting with an empty ring for a long time. Uh, it can really drag a day out. Um, I think judging is very tiring, uh, even though you're just sitting in a chair. Some, some shows go on for 10 and 12 hours and you have to keep your concentration up. Yeah. And uh, um, that's something I have to work at and not allow my mind to drift. I've got to really focus on, on paying a tremendous amount of attention and keeping good notes. The bookkeeping is uh, equally important. So I think judging is very difficult. And uh, so anytime I hear anybody criticize a judge, I always stand up for judges because I have, people have no idea how hard it is and how long the day can be. Right. Good point. Good point. Um, you know, in the hunter ring or, you know, as a judge, what do you look for in a in a successful hunter round? Uh, smoothness would probably be the first thing. Um, keeping an even pace, the horse jumping in beautiful form, making it look effortless. Mm -hmm. uh, a horse that I would want to ride if I was showing just the ease of it where if you um it should just look very smooth and simple and um like watching a ballet dance or something great um you know and in terms of the rider what what do you want to see the a hunter rider doing being invisible hmm. Um, you, you know, you don't want to be distracted by the rider. You want to just be watching the horse. So I like to see a rider do as little as possible. So my eye is not drawn to her or him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, what are some, you know, do you have any pet peeves, you know, when you're judging, uh, you know, hunter round? Anything you don't like to see? Anything I don't like to see. Anything obvious, certainly. I don't want to see any roughness or loss of temper or anything like that. Um, I don't want to see horses that aren't clean. Or, um, and uh, as far as the equitation, I don't want to see somebody come in with dirty boots. I never understand how that can happen. Uh, even if you don't have a groom, why you couldn't grab a towel and wipe your boots off. Um, or dirty tack or the wrong tack. Equitation wise, uh, I don't want to see a twist in the rain or um, sometimes at the lower levels, riders don't know how to hold two reins 
and they put some curb on the outside, the stamp on the inside on a pillow. And um, I like the bite of the rain to be on the right side, which I don't feel real strongly about because I don't think there's a right or wrong as far as which side the rain is held on. But definitely not over the top of the rain, if you know what I mean. The bite of the rain being over the top of the rain that goes from the hand to the bit. I mean, that's really improper. I see that on in uh, beginner classes. Hmm. Okay. Um, meaning, so like the bite should be sort of, if you're holding the reins, the bite should be sort of then flowing down the horse's neck. Right. Underneath the rein that goes directly to the bed. And I prefer it on the right, as I said, that it's not wrong to be on the left, so I would never penalize anybody for that. Another thing, um, as a lower levels, I don't see riders sit to the canter. Um, they're in a, uh, in a two point or a half seat when they're cantering in an equitation class. And uh, I mean, that reflects on the trainer that doesn't know the difference between under saddle and equitation on the flat. When I give clinics, I always specify that. And um, a lot of people don't know that. They certainly know it as a higher level, but um, not so much as a uh, local shows. Mm -hmm. And so in the equitation, you want people to be in what kind of seat? A full seat, three points, sitting as a canter, just like sitting trot. Sitting trot is that really is hard for a lot of me, medium riders, average riders. They don't have a, a developed seat. Anything else about judging? You know, you, you judge so much and you have so much wisdom. There's any other pet peeves while you're judging equitation? We kind of talked about in the hunter ring, but. Um, yeah, I think just cleanliness and turnout is um, so important in the equitation ring. And uh, riders don't have to necessarily have the most expensive clothes, but they could be fitted properly and clean. Um, uh, something I don't care for at all is really short jackets. That's I know that's a fad, but I think that's um, my eye has not gotten accustomed to that at all. Um, where the jacket is um, really short, like above the seat, and uh, regardless of a rider's build, I think that's a very unflattering look. So that's something that I really dislike. But again, uh, if that was the best rider in the class, I'd have to go with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since you mentioned cleanliness, like why do you feel that's important? I think um, I'm a detail oriented person and anybody you talk to like McLean Ward is that way. And I think if you prepare everything to your best ability. The horse is clean, the turnout is super good, um, your boots are polished, you, you cover every detail that is going to reflect in everything else you do. And it's just like getting to the show early, learning the course, um, really being on top of it, at least if you do all that and you go in and you don't have a good round or you have a bad job, at least you can say, I did everything I could to prepare for it instead of being so sloppy. Um, <laughs> not being clean is sloppy to me and sloppy um, uh, overflows into everything else. Preparation of the horse. You know, if you're sl you can't win if you're sloppy or lazy. You, it's a tough sport, and you've really got to stay on top of everything and try to um, really be detail oriented. I really think that reflects uh, as in your performance. Interesting, and I like what you said about you know if if you do take care of all of those details that are in your control you know right. it seems like when you're in the ring there are things you know especially working with horses that are not in your control but if you if you sort of take care of everything um you know then then you can't be upset with yourself if something right. is, yeah you just say well so be it you know i do you know something spooked my horse or whatever but um um, if you get there late and you're, if you get there late and you're disorganized, it's, it's like a uh, foundation to a house 
not being solid and everything on top is going to crumble. It just doesn't work that way. Right. Good point. I guess, you know, you talked about um, rideability with horses and, and needing the basics. And, you know, when you're at a clinic and I was curious, do you have any like go to exercises to help with rideability? Oh, yes. Uh, one of my favorite ones, and we did a video of it for Practical Horsemen, is the one where I stand on the other side. I start with a pole on the ground and hold my hand up and have the rider get established a nice rhythm as a canter and then canter over the pole and, went, and look at my hand as they're doing it. Uh, I actually have, a, have them look over at my hand prior to the pole, about three strides away, and watch my hand over and after the pole and just concentrate on the rhythm and not the pole. And um, then I, then I shift over to a little jump and do the same thing. And if they keep their eye on my hand and concentrate on the rhythm, they get to the little jump almost the same distance every time. Or if there's any variation, it's just a matter of inches. And it really impresses them. I have a, a lady that I've been doing that with at my barn who wanted to override and got the horse very strong as a result of it. And when she looks at my hand, she doesn't do that because she can't see the little jump and stays on this lovely rhythm. And it always works. I've never, if it doesn't work, it's because the rider isn't following the, the exercise. But uh, that is a, a, probably my favorite exercise that I use in a lot of clinics and then shift it over to having them look at a point beyond the jump because obviously I can't be in the ring with them. Uh, that la the lady I just started working with asked me if I could, kiddingly, she said, can you go to the horse show and, you know, stand at the end of every line? <laughs> but, uh, obviously, or have a cut out picture of me at the end of every line of jumps. Well, obviously we can't do that. So I'm going to have her next step will be to focus on a point. And that's something that that um, Victor was adamant about. In the indoor ring at Cedar Lodge, there were eyes painted on the wall. And that was one of his questions was, where, are your, where were your eyes if a, if a rider had a bad jump? Because he was so insistent on them raising their eye off the jump once they were approaching and looking at the eyes that were painted up at the end of the ring. Um, that works for many people, not everybody, but uh, that's a helpful, a helpful tool. Yeah. And, you know, when would you say so, you know, you want the people to to the riders to pick up a, a, a good rhythm and establish a good rhythm. And then, you know, as they're like where in the pr approach or would the person take their eyes off the jump and then look at you or. You know, well, I have, them, I have them establish a rhythm for depending on the rider and how much space they need, probably 20 strides away from the pole or the little jump. And then, then, I, then I have them look at it and line themselves up with it. So I would say three strides away. I'll hold up my hand and sometimes I'll move around. I'll start doing it directly in front of them and then give them enough space to pass me. And then I'll start moving to the side. And sometimes I'll have them turn, if I'm on the side, they'll have to literally turn their head and look right at me because sometimes people will cheat and they'll kind of peek as a jump and then look back at my hand. And I also will hold up fingers and have them tell me how many fingers I'm holding up just so they're um, constantly concentrating on that more than the jump and that's helpful it's just a means to an end you know? right why 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 does this work like what is the purpose of have them having them look at your hand as opposed to the jump because they not being able to see a distance they don't adjust they don't fiddle so it works with horses too that are quick um, not that a horse can look at my hand but just working on a circle over um, a jump um, oh, I like to lunge horses over jumps too for the same reason. But when they look over at my hand, they can't see the jump. Therefore, they can't um, look for a long distance and move up. They have to stay the same because they have no idea where they are in relationship to the jump. And it's low enough that um, just a cross rail or a two foot vertical. Um, I've done it with. Um, higher jumps too with better riders but all they can do is look at my hand and feel the rhythm 
Right. Okay. So this is more about just getting, I think you, when we talked about it, you know, when we were preparing for the, the video shoot, um, you talked about how, you know, even as a judge, you'll see people change their minds several times on what distance they're seeing. And hence then they change the horse's rhythm. And you, I think you said like, that's the worst thing you can do. Right. Sometimes people will, um, don't have a very good depth perception and they'll go three strides away from the jump or two strides and try to make two strides into one, which is impossible. And um, I'll spend a lot of time showing people where the horse should leave the ground, how the arc should be over the center of the jump and land on the uh, other side at an equal distance away from the jump. And it's one thing to come out of a turn. You can make six strides into seven or six into five if you do it early enough, you can move up a little bit or close your hand and add a stride. But it's impossible to to do it right on top of the jump. And that, that never works. You'll either be terribly long and launch a horse doing that or cause them to stop or have a rail, depending on what division you're in. It's too late. And at that point, when you're right on, I, I tell people to have have two plans. Plan A is when you see the distance and you know what to do. You see it a little long, you're far enough back where you can just move up and get the long one and go with the horse, or you see it a little deep and you sit up and softly close your hand and ask them to shorten and balance and it works out, or you see a great distance and you just enjoy it. That's plan A, but plan B is when you don't see anything, you're totally confused and you're three strides away from the jump, you don't know whether you're three or four or two, then I tell them plan B is to sit very still and keep the horse in balance. And the worst thing that's going to happen is they'll just get there a little quietly and pat the ground. Because chances are when people don't see it, there isn't uh, an ideal distance there. So you you're not in a position to tell your horse to shorten or lengthen if you don't know where you are, if, you, if you're following me. With yeah. That. yeah. And, uh, you know, it would be better. Sometimes I jokingly say you'd be better off if you'd close your eyes because then you wouldn't have made that big move in front of the jump. And I don't necessarily advocate that, but it um, uh, paints a good picture. Right, right. So rather than like changing and maybe confusing your horse and as you said, throwing them off balance, you know, within three strides of the jump, it's better to almost let him figure it out. Um, exactly, exactly. Because you don't know which, if you're telling them the right thing, if you're confused, you know, how do you know whether lengthening is the right thing? And if you lunge a horse over a jump, you'll see the horse make an adjustment. And if it's getting there wrong, it'll just shorten up. It's interesting, you know, some horses do it better than others, but uh, you've got to be smooth and, and keep the horse in balance and comfortable. When I was... Um, bringing green horses along I might get to one a little deep or one a little long but my horses really trusted me because I never uh, lied to them you know I never started steadying and then all of a sudden changed my mind and and ask them to go forward and leave, and leave long or the other way around um, I would look up at the jump and I might say to myself you know, I'm gonna, shoot, this is a little deep, but I'd make it work. I think a good rider makes every distance work instead of just um, panicking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And even if, you know, you're you're an amateur, or, you know, um, not 100 percent confident in, in your ability to see a distance, um, still staying the same and not interfering with your horse's balance is the exactly. better approach than trying to you know, quote unquote, fix it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think, um, kind of backing up a little bit, why, why do you think, and I know, especially when I was riding as a junior and a little bit as an amateur, um, just like so focused on finding a distance and being so concerned about it. Why do you think that's the case with so many, why, why do you think people get fixated on that? 
Well, uh, certainly it's important to meet all the jumps the same and find good distances to them. Rhythm is number one. And I can remember, I think Victor was probably the first person to say um, to me, stop worrying about the distance and think more about the rhythm. And at the time, my uh, subconscious said, are you kidding? I don't, I don't have time to think about the rhythm. I'm too busy looking for a distance. Um, I didn't say anything because I was a very good student. But I remember thinking, what? You know, distance is everything. But if it's obvious and you're going around and that's all you're thinking about, it's going to be for the world to see and the horse will probably get quick if you're asking it to, you know, leave long or making multitudinous adjustments where the rhythm covers that up if you're a little bit deep to one and a little bit long to the other as long as you don't violate the rhythm it's almost um, uh, imperceptible hmm. I love that I, it's I think um, riders and again speaking of myself um, can can overcomplicate yes riding sometimes um, great um, just a couple more questions I, I guess could you Talk about your overall training philosophy. Well, as far as working with riders, I work on their position and their technique before I do anything else because um, it influences the horse so much. Hmm. It's really important to have the rider be able to use their aids properly before I can focus on the horse. The rider influences everything. So it's very important to have um, basics, uh, solid basics with the riders. And then I can go on and address whatever needs to be done with their horse. And uh, so generally, the answer would be creating correct fundamentals in the rider. Great. And, you know, I know you don't have a rider right in front of you, but could you talk just a little bit about what those fun fundamentals are? Like what what's important to you in terms of, uh, you know, a rider's position? Having a solid base of support, meaning weight in the heel, a quiet leg, uh, a strong core, having their their body not stiff, but um, solid so they can keep their hands and arms independent of their body. Uh, soft hands and an arm that uh, has flexibility in it um, where they bend their, um, use the hinge in their, their elbow and they can put their, you with their hand and uh, have a relaxed arm is really important. And their balance where they hold their upper body um, they've got to be able to sit in the middle of the horse. And if they're sitting, that's, that's in the center. And if they get up and um, I, I call it lightening their seat, which is like a two-point, um, uh, not quite a two-point, it's like a half seat. It's like a full seat is three point what I call it and then the next one would be half seat and then higher up out of the saddle would be more of a two point where you have no contact with your seat but I have my riders um, ride with a very light seat but not leaning forward having their hip angle open but being out of the saddle and then an independent hand and an arm and it's so important to be in the middle of the horse because you uh, have to be there in order to lengthen and shorten and then with training longitudinal work straight lines lengthening shortening and then lateral work where they're bending and doing shoulder in leg heels things just basic very very basic dressage movements stopping backing up if you can get your horse doing all that then it becomes very adjustable to the jumps great great um and and overall, I like I like to ask this question. You know, what what do you think makes a good horseman? What makes a good horseman is somebody who cares about the well being of the horse in all aspects. In all aspects, people, oh, a horseman to me is somebody who 
knows about feeding, um, the way the um, blacksmiths choose their horse, whether um, knowing how, what to look for when the horse gets shot, checking the angles, um, being involved with every single aspect, the turnout, um, the care after a horse is ridden, whether to put ice boots on or liniment or pack their feet or any of those things. It's just all the tremendous amount of care goes into a horse that's in work. Great. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I always love uh, chatting with you, Holly. So thank you so much for for sitting down and talking with us. You're very welcome. Glad to do it anytime, Sandy. It's fun. Thanks for listening to this week's episode with Holly Hugo Vidal. And a big thank you to the episode sponsor, Bimeda. Learn more at BimedaUS.com. You can subscribe to the Practical Horseman podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While there, please rate and review the show. I'm Sandra Olenek, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman podcast.